Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. My name is Andrew Johnstone. Welcome to the next panel discussion, which is on marine renewable energy and the disrupting effect that it's having in the industry. To set the scene, um, you've heard all about the metrics of the ocean over the last day, no doubt, but there are a couple of further facts I want to just put out there. Firstly, the fact that the ocean is obviously enormous. It constitutes 99% of the living environment by volume that we as a species, um, both hu human and other, inhabit. Um, it, including ourselves, is the home to over 2 million species that we do know of. And importantly, it is also a 30% uh, sequestrator of climate of CO2 that we do generate as a greenhouse gas. Further, it's the largest source of protein, and it is an employer of over 3 billion people. As an economy, it's equivalent to the eighth largest GDP in the world, at $2.5 trillion per year. And that economy is spread over a whole number of industries. Outputting, output um, metrics like fishing, aquaculture, and um, agriculture, transportation and shipping and freight, productive coastlines, tourism and the likes, as well as job creation. And all of those activities will be very negatively affected uh, and almost fatally to an extent, to the extent we do not sustain sustainable, sustainable oceans. But equally importantly, all four of those industries are dependent on power. And the transition from the energy transition away from fossil fuels to renewable energy is a ever present a very key part of the world in which we live and the oceans have a very important role to play in, the, in that transition. Today we've got a panel for discussion that comprises entrepreneurs, uh, academics, sector experts um, and we're very privileged and I welcome you gentlemen to the panel this afternoon. The panel format will take the running order of introductions from each of the gentlemen introducing themselves and their perspectives on the topic of the day. There'll be a couple of themes which we'll seek to explore. And for the participants who, have, who are connected into this conference, you are encouraged to post questions and answers in the chat, which we'll seek to pick up in the latter part of the conversation. So with, without, without further ado, um, I want to just then go to the panelists and ask you by rotation, and I'll, I'll, I'll do so by name, just for you to introduce yourselves, um, the organizations or businesses that you represent, and what brings you to the conversation today. Starting with you, please, Matthew. Great. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you for the introduction. Um, my name is Matthew Bray. I run a startup in aeronautical engineering that focuses on uh, creation of morphing structures and morphing aerofoils. So we design um, wind turbine blades that are able to change shape and increase efficiencies and decrease structural loads. Um, we're in the R&D stage. And we're based in um, Johannesburg, South Africa. Um, and I'm coming to the panel to contribute you know, our experience as a startup uh, in the space, looking at technologies which either are impacting or uh, implemented in ocean environments and ocean wind. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Lucio Elio, over to you, sir. Yes, thank you. Thank you uh, for the panelist and um, for the organizer for co inviting me. I'm, um, I'm Luiselio Pinto. I'm coming from San Tomé Principe. I have um, um, a startup that is Krypton uh, that is looking at uh, opportunities and solutions uh, that addresses the, the issues of, um, of uh, development uh, in a broader sense, more, more, more focus on sustainable ideas for the future of. So main principle. I'm also been counseling uh, the government and the NGOs on issues related to the most sustainable choices for the future of our island. Thank you. Well, th thanks for making the time to join us this afternoon. Francesco? Thank you, Andrew. Yes, I work at the International Renewable Energy Agency, IRENA. IRENA is an intergovernmental organization with the mandate to support the governments in the widespread deployment of renewable energy technologies. At the moment, we have around 161 member countries 
and another 20 in the process of um, uh, applying for membership. And basically the governments uh, are represented in our agency through the ministries of energy, economics, and, and uh, foreign affairs. Uh, I'm leading here a, a team working on technology innovation for renewals in our innovation and technology center, which is based in Bonn in Germany. And recently we have been working a lot of work on offshore renewables and we will be launching two reports on the topic of ocean energy on the 1st of December that will be publicly available in our website. So great. Uh, I think well, I thank you there. very much. And we'll circle back to talk to you a little bit later about the trends that you see both in the in the media and the and the long term. So thanks for um thanks for joining us this afternoon. Uh Marius. Hello everyone. Thanks Andrew. Uh Marius Hugo, the founder of a company called Mean Sea Level. We're busy piloting our ocean wave energy technology uh, in Hermanus, South Africa. It's a one megawatt pilot plant and um, ocean wave energy obviously being slap bang square in the middle of this topic of uh, ocean renewables. Um, so yeah, look forward to the conversation. Well, that's great, Morris. Thanks, Simile, thank, thanks, for, um, thanks for joining us. I know, I know the, the life of an entrepreneur is a challenging one, so to carve out the time for our chat this afternoon, really appreciate it. And, we, and we, we want to hear more about it later on, about the trials and tribulations and what, what guys like you need to get your businesses um, growing and doing what it needs to do within this very demanding area. But to kick off then the, um, the first theme to explore, gentlemen, trends, you know, both historic and future. I think our, our, our audience probably want to hear more about the future, but um, if you find it useful just to backtrack to set the trajectory going forward to talk a little bit about what's happened in the past, past feel free to do so. So energy is a is, is an all-pervasive um, thing. It's far more than electrons. It has a role in the technology that it, by which it's built or generated. It is a contributor to economy. It generates wealth. It generates cash flows. And it also has a, has a, a deep impact on society, the production of electricity and the uh, provision of heating, lighting, uh, and cooling to societies is one of the most fundamental contributors to to um, human rights and, and societal development. Uh, you can pick any one of those themes, Francisco, because I know Irina has a very broad research base. So any one of those, sir, um, what are you seeing? What are you seeing in the in the immediate and the and the, the midterm? Thanks, Andrew. Yeah, well, first of all, uh, we see in the arena an increased interest uh, from uh, our member countries on offshore renewals in general. And our definition of offshore renewals includes offshore wind, uh, uh, also floating wind, ocean energy technologies, which goes to subcategories such as wave, tidal, or ocean thermal energy conversion and salinity gradient, and also floating PV. So everything that can produce uh, electricity uh, and is installed in the on the water. So this is the our definition, and of course within that uh, there are different levels of uh, maturity in these technologies. So while offshore wind is getting uh, maturity very quickly, and we already are in capacity installed capacity of around 20 gigawatts of installed capacity, ocean energy is in a different at a different level. Uh, currently, we have just half a gigawatt of installed capacity coming from offshore, uh, sorry, ocean energy. And that's basically from a, one of the subcategories, tidal, and it's tidal range. And it's basically two projects one project in Korea and one project in France, both on, on tidal range, which is basically, you can imagine, it's like a hydro dam, just uh, going up and down with the tides. These two projects almost account for the whole installed capacity of ocean energy. The rest are a small pilot plants looking into tidal or wave mainly, and also a little bit OTEC and, and salinity gradient. The one where we see more development is tidal. It's the one which is getting more closer to commercialization, especially now what is called a tidal stream. So basically is uh, due to the tide, the current of, of, of water and the flow of water. And the main designs are, you can imagine like a wind turbine just put in the water. So basically, the flow of the water just moves the turbine and produces electricity. Uh, 
And uh, in that uh, case, we already see that there are projects, uh, uh, announced projects going up to the scale of close to three uh, gigawatts. Now, WAVE uh, is the next one, which is a little bit in a less mature uh, stage, but we are seeing also quite some development in the number of projects, and we can expect also to see around 1.5 gigawatts uh, in prototypes in the next uh, five years. Now, uh, having said that on the technology, what is important to keep in mind is that it's very good to have uh, many designs and many prototypes and everything and foster innovation, but at certain point, we need some technology conversion to scale up. If we, if we see the case of uh, PV, for example, uh, the scale up was mainly on the multi-crystalline technology. If we see the case of, of uh, wind turbines, it basically wind went with the uh, horizontal axis three bladed turbines and then we scale up. Whereas what we see is that there is still maybe not such a conversion in ocean energy technology. And again, while innovation is great, at certain point we need to start to have some conversion. In Tidal, apparently there is some uh, conversion now towards basically horizontal water turbines. That's one, but in WAVE, we still have too many different prototypes. And of course, if you want to imagine a manufacturing industry looking into a big market to have uh, economies of scale and reduce the cost, you need that market. If you continue with small prototypes of different versions here and there, it will be quite difficult. So this sure. is one, maybe one comment. Now going to the economic, uh, sorry, the social aspect is that uh, we see all these projects now link also to uh, the SDGs, the UN uh, Social Development Goals, particularly the seven and the uh, 14, but also linked to other activities such as water desalination, aquaculture, seawater cooling. So this is another interesting uh, trend that we are seeing. And I think I will stop there. All right, that's very interesting. Thank you. So if I, if I can summarize what I think I heard is that um, the, the offshore wind uh, and solar sectors are far more mature from a technological perspective. Their scale has been delivered through convergence of technologies, and that evolution is still ahead of us in respect of wave and tidal. Huge potential, but to get that scale, one needs convergence of technologies. Um, thank you for that. Uh, um, Lucielo, what are, what are your views? What, what, what trends... Are you see uh, so if, you know the trends that I see um, uh, actually are the ones that um, especially in my country uh, I don't know as you are you are aware uh, this is a, a, an archipelago two islands two small island 2,000 to 100,000 uh, population and uh, we've been we live off uh, almost 98 percent of of the uh, of the generators uh, oil generators fuel generators and uh, and we've been of course we've been uh, you know uh, been uh, um, uh, working with the international partners and multilaterals and in, in guising devising the, the, those plans and those uh, um, you know uh, uh, you know in a way to you know to 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 to, uh, to work on on this sustainable development goals in terms of, of, of incorporating them in the, in the vision for the future. So in a way, I see the trend. Here, I divide uh, our situation into three dimensions. You have the dimension, the political dimension. You have the economic dimension. You have the social dimension. And, uh, you know, we, as we see all these, all the technology, we have, uh, we know about them, but they are not, they are far from being deployed as South America because, you know, the, we, we haven't, uh, had uh, you know a clear view of what to do uh, in terms of tapping into the resources that are in the ocean. So you know we have more ocean uh, than we have land. And uh, but uh, as far as as far as I know, for the you know since we are independent from seventy five, so forty four years, forty five years on, uh, we've been looking at at, uh, at the ocean as uh, for the leisure and for some um, rudimentary uh, uh, fishing. Uh, not really in the industries. So when also AMP, as you you know, you can point any of the um, the technology, the, the technology technologies that are up there for you know, for uh, for the power for transforming into power. Okay, we look at the, we look at them, but we haven't seen anything happening uh, in South America. So we need, in a way, we need a vision. And so this is why the dimension, the political dimension, comes in. 
the, the vision so that we can look at this and you know and in a clear way with the consensus with the political consensus look at it and go beyond what we have been doing I mean, i'm not putting in uh, into this perspective the pollution that we've been uh, putting in our uh, seas with the plastics and the, everything um, up from there so and then you have the economic side that it means it's not only about power it's about aquaculture there are other other sectors that could be um, uh, other uh, application that could be uh, driven from 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 the oceans and we've been looking at, at them but you know and and but in a way the social side that i put in here is that you know uh, as a society uh, all these things seem so far away and and uh, and so out of the blue said so it's going to take time even here uh, um, you have a, a portfolio the minister of finance has a joint portfolio that is blue ocean uh, blue economy yeah. actually yeah blue economy but you know but it seems to be like it's not really uh, as we as far as i know we don't see it as some something that is a real portfolio uh, because uh, finance is always a very important ministry but we are not we have, we have not seen a, a push towards you know getting um, into this uh, arena so that we can then uh, forge cooperation with the arena with the other players and uh, not to say the the private sector to look into uh, these possibilities so so now it's so that's a very interesting very interesting interesting perspectives that you say that that there's an awareness of that it does exist but doesn't really feel real it doesn't really feel tangible and what what do you think needs to happen? What needs to happen to incentivize either the sector, the industry, the awareness to actually make it as real as turning on the light bulb, light bulb with the switch on the wall? Yes, Andre, it's, it's a good point because I myself, I find myself uh, in a way because we are not, of course, many of, of the colleagues of the panelists uh, are entrepreneurs. They have uh, projects uh, on, on, on going to work already, oh, but here, uh, even as a startup, uh, uh, you know, uh, my is not, you know, I, actually I'm starting. My startup is working on the political side and not uh, on the on the technological side of the development. Yes. Because I need I need to convince uh, uh, the political players and the, all the sec stakeholders that we need to look in, uh, into that. And, and you know, as you know, these are very costly technology. They need a lot of a lot of uh, scientific knowledge that we don't have here. But, you know, so we need to, everything, but in a way, you know, and so we don't have time to have all these pieces together so that we can start. So we, we need something uh, to trigger it. And there, there, there's been discussion. Now I know that um, for the last year and this year, there have been a, um, a strategic uh, uh, document on, on Blue Ocean that was sponsored by uh, FAO, which is uh, the, uh, we say FAO, the FAO. The, mm -hmm. uh, the IGC from United Nations for, for food because of food security. Um, and, you know, and, but, but this, this document is still on the, not uh, widely um, addressed to the public. So uh, in a way, the, here the things need to go uh, counterway. It's going to be the social, the social awareness, if it happens in the society, uh, see it as a very important thing. So then it can uh, go uh, another ladder, ladder and comes and stick into the political uh, discussion and narrative, which is something that's not happening now. Okay, okay. So, you su so you're suggesting that it needs to be it needs to be a bottom-up filtering of awareness that that the yes, that, exactly that, that the political awareness make. I mean, the, the public awareness makes it the political awareness, which then makes it a social action. Okay. Exactly. Let, me, let me take that same theme across to you, Matthew. I mean. From your introduction, it sounds like what you do is is, is very, very bespoke and very specialist. Um, how how aware would you say the broader stakeholder community that needs to be engaged to make marine renewable energy a reality? How aware of them are they of the potential, the existence, and businesses like yourself? Right. So I think the, the answer to that is very geographically specific. So if you're looking at Europe, uh, it's a far more developed market in terms of funding and supporting these types of technologies as well as getting them integrated into power supply. Um, one of the things you're seeing is, as well as technology uh, convergence, as Francisco talked about, you're also seeing business model innovation to support technology. So um, 
things like hybrid systems where you've got wind and solar or um, undersea and wind together to increase the viability of these projects and help them you know, get off the ground and have the, the financial legs to stand on their own. Um, that's one side of it. And then you know, in developing markets, the priorities are obviously quite different. Uh, we've faced you know, big headwinds in this country around you know, getting the right kind of funding and getting into the right spaces and getting the awareness, as you say, of stakeholders to to the need to integrate and, and um, fund these types of initiatives. Um, but it is in, it is improving. I think that there's no corner of the world at the moment that isn't talking about sustainability and about growth in the renewable energy industry. So it's just a case of, of getting the technologies to a point where they can compete, perhaps uh, combining them with other technologies to make them more viable and gradually educating the, the decision makers in the necessary areas. I just want to jump back to Francisco on this point. Then I'm going to come to you, um, Marius. And Francisco, you mentioned the the sectors of uh, offshore, offshore tidal and um, and wave, and those obviously followed on the more traditional renewable energy or ground mount solar and wind and and hydro. Listening to what the gentlemen say, that at some point there needs to be an inflection point of awareness that people get it, be those politicians or or the, um, Joe Public. What is that inflection point? What's going to make people aware of the potential and the existence of tidal power to the extent that they are aware of solar panels, ground mount solar at the moment, do you think? Thanks, Andre. I think in some geographies, we already got uh, that turning point. Like, for example, in Europe, in China, and Canada. Uh, something that is very promising is that uh, on last week, 19 of November, the European Commission uh, released their offshore renewals strategy. And in that one, they have a target to have uh, more than one gigawatt of a wave and tidal technologies by 2030 in Europe, and more uh, than 40 gigawatts by 2050. Yeah, which is aligned also with our targets uh, from IRENA, which globally we look into having more than 10 gigawatts by 2030 and more than 100 gigawatts of wave and tidal by 2050. In Canada, they have uh, devoted feeding tariffs for tidal energy, which is already attracting quite some participants. In China, they also have a um, policy mechanism uh, for wave and tidal. Yeah. And on top of that, I think what uh, Matthew was mentioning about business models is critical. What we see is that ocean energy uh, projects need to look not only into the traditional model of selling kilowatt hours, but also selling services, like for example, uh, cooling of buildings through thick water, uh, yep. for example, desalination of water. These are kind of the high value services which can, uh, where ocean energy has a potential uh, added value and advantage. And one final point on what uh, Lucello also mentioned, uh, he's totally right. I mean, uh, uh, the policy uh, buying is crucial. And for that, what we see is that the socioeconomical part on the jobs creation on all these co-benefits that we discussed about aquaculture, desalination of water so on, need to be better explained to policymakers why this is a compelling case for renewal, for ocean energy. Even if they continue to be a little bit more expensive than other uh, areas, you can imagine, for example, in remote islands in the Pacific, where they have to import a diesel in, in barges for weeks or months, you know? Uh, in that location, even having uh, a little bit more expensive than traditional ocean energy makes total sense because it's a more reliable source of energy. As we said to mention, they have issues about land scarcity. So basically they don't have land to install big wind turbines or big solar farms. So ocean energy is already a compelling solution in, in such cases. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So, so Marius, so what we've heard thus far is um, policy is important, programs are important to get scale, technological convergence is important to, I guess, get precedence, get understanding and to mobilize capital behind it. What are, what are you seeing from a techn technological perspective? What are the innovations out there? What are what what's what's new? What's good? What's still ahead of us? Thank you, Andrew, um, and uh, everyone so far. I think maybe I've seen uh, too many movies, but uh, to me, it's about momentum. Um, you know, it feels like as an entrepreneur in the 
specifically the wave energy, uh, to Francisco's point, we're fighting battles all over the, sh the show. You know, every entrepreneur is, is fighting his own little battle to try and prove that his technology or her technology is um, competitive and scalable. But I think a few successes would go a long way to galvanize uh, energy and support uh, and, and, and start building a momentum to start, uh, you know, Francisco, to your point, um, to start knowledge conversion uh, in a certain direction. Uh, a good example is um, is offshore wind at the moment. Uh, I don't know if you agree, but offshore wind seems to has have uh, suddenly sucked up all the, the energy and funding um, in the ocean renewables uh, space. Um, and actually from traditionally uh, land-based technology. So uh, it, it's, it's a good example. As soon as the kind of that inflection point is reached, uh, the momentum uh, uh, starts going. Uh, in our case, um, and it's been mentioned a couple of times, uh, our company was born out of the energy needs of an aquaculture farm, um, a company in South Africa called Abergold, the largest producer of uh, abalone uh, in South Africa and potentially the Southern Hemisphere. And um, they're running pumps 24 seven. So, um, you know, we looked at solar, we looked at wind, uh, but the baseload requirement for them um, in the renewable space was was the most important. Um, so we, yeah, we initially looked to someone else to do it for us, but then realized there was nothing out there. So um, yeah, it's, it's an exciting time. It's kind of like that race to the moon and um, you know who's going to be first to prove commercial viability and scalability in the ocean wave space and it's exciting to be part of that race um, but once we get there then uh, then we need the rest of the community government civil society especially the academic institutions um, to kind of build the momentum around to 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 uh, to win out at the end and be part of that energy mix and Morris, you you have Francisco's view that what what builds scale is convergence of technology. It sounds that the the business you've got is is quite bespoke. It was it solved a problem on the day. How do you see technology converging around around wave um, wave power generation? Look, I um, I think our energy requirement might be quite niche, but our uh, the application or the technology is as scalable as we can make it. It's a it's a shore based wave energy converter uh, which makes use of uh, the overtopping principle. So essentially, we build a dam next to the sea, next to any sea, uh, right. with a slope with a slope facing the oncoming waves. The waves run up the slope into the dam, which is then higher than sea level, and then goes back through a hydroelectric turbine. So it's it's simple okay. stuff. Um, okay. It's definitely no no uh, underwater cabling or mooring a deep underwater or divers or ships or dry dock facilities. We try to sidestep all of the difficult parts. <laughs> um, but uh, the nice thing is it um, it's close to shore and it's it's scalable on coastline uh, and it's simple. Now the hard part for us is building in the surf zone, and unfortunately that's a very expensive thing to do. So that's where a lot of our energy has been going. Um, but yeah, the idea is definitely to become commercially viable and uh, and then scalable. So we definitely don't see ourselves as a niche player. So two things I'm gonna come back to, because because uh, this is fascinating. One is, does it work at low tide? And what are the consequences of um, rising sea levels with, uh, with global warming? But before coming to that, Matthew, I want to come to, I want to hear a little bit more about what your business does. Um, I'm I'm intrigued. What is it? Okay. <laughs> so we work uh, particularly in flexible and compliant structures. So uh, if you think about any wing or any uh, blade for a turbine, for example, particularly for this conversation, all of them are rigid and have a rigid shape. Um, and that's great for producing power in the optimal zone. But if you're looking at storm loading conditions or if you're looking at efficiency across a number of different wind speeds, 
Um, that's not optimal. So what we've designed is some core IP which allows us to change the shape of an aerofoil or change the shape of a wing uh, with, uh, with uh, commercially viable materials, it doesn't add cost, um, and is a really simple and implementable uh, solution. So we are currently focusing on wind turbine blade design uh, or horizontal axis wind turbine design. Uh, and that really is to reduce the storm loadings on uh, wind turbines at scale so that they can have lighter structures, lighter foundations, far lower environmental impact. Um, and it applies to uh, ocean energy as well in terms of underwater turbines as well as uh, all of your offshore wind. Because all of those need very expensive, large foundations and actual structure sizes. And if we can bring the costs of those down, we bring the viability of that energy solution up a lot. Uh, so our focus really is in, in um, composite design and, and engineering, and then really that idea of changing the shape of the blade. And and who are you providing these services for and to? Is it, it's the large wind turbine manufacturers, the big boys. Yeah, so we're in the R&D phase at the moment. So we're funded by public okay. and private um, research and development money. But our vision is to work with uh, wind turbine companies. We really started negotiating our first sort of partnership to test the technology at a larger scale. Um, and then the technology applies across a number of different industries as well into um, aircraft and UAVs and anywhere where you're interacting with uh, a flow or an air or water stream. So at the moment, we are still early stage, but you know our, our prototypes are up and running and we're moving into the commercialization phase now. That's really interesting. So coming back to um, what Francisco was talking about with the evolution of the different sectors and, and clearly the enormous impact that China had on the, on the solar, solar market with their, with their bulk production, driving the costs down, the efficiencies up, um, and also with their most recent declaration of moving towards 350-odd gigawatts within the next 10 years, um, which is pretty much the current installed capacity of renewable energy globally today. Um, how does that impact the other technology providers, do you think? I mean, how does that impact this, the entrepreneurs who are coming up with innovative and clever solutions like yourselves. Um, Morris? So oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, no, go, go ahead, Matthew. Yeah. You take the lead. Sorry, you broke up there. Did you tell me to take the lead? Yeah, yeah, you go. Okay, sorry. Um, so it, it is difficult because as Francisco says, there is convergence to a particular solution. and. Renewable energies, as much as they're about innovation, they're also about um, about lowest cost of energy. The, the The reality is that it has to be viable, and that large scale development of a particular solution means that your economies of scale are particularly important. And innovation is tough because innovation is expensive. If you can, um, sorry, it's back on board. if you can uh, get a technology to to um, a level where it's price competitive, then that's fantastic. But it's quite difficult to do um, when you're dealing with quite a conservative industry in renewable energies. So that's yeah. one of the major obstacles. So guys, I'm going to go around the table now, sort of the, as a final wrap up. Um, I'll give you the heads up what the question is, so you've got time to think about it. So, so if if you were to wave a wand and change one thing tomorrow, to a make the sector. Um, better and more mature and more success, successful or or more advanced and and secondly in your own particular circumstance whether you're on an island or doing creative stuff like um, turbine design or or innovative individual wave wave sourced energy solutions what would that one thing be so let me start actually with you Francisco what 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 is the one thing that we need to do tomorrow um to make marine renewable energy uh, a success quickly mm -hmm. yeah so i think three three points there one is the political aspect again to bring up to the attention to policy makers all the co-benefits of ocean energy and where the niche market for those uh, technologies are the second point uh, again coming back to what matthew mentioned before is that Think not just about innovation in technology. Think also about innovation in business models. How you can add uh, value to your project also with other revenue streams. Okay. I think that's important. And for entrepreneurs, I think that uh, continue to be creative, but maybe do not try to reinvent the wheel. International cooperation is important. Try to learn from others. 
There is one uh, international standardization committee under the International Electrotechnical Commission, the IEC Technical Com Committee 114. Look at what they are doing because they are trying to actually standardize these technologies, look into what big investors are looking to mitigate the risk of these technologies and scale up your technology quicker. So look Got at it. the work, for example, that they are uh, doing. Thanks. Got it. Don't reinvent the wheel. Lucilio, what is your one, what's your wave wandering wish? The wave, wave, wand waving wish. Uh, <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, look, uh, I'm I'm now I've been working. You know, I don't know if you are aware of Seeds Doc, which is an entity uh, um, uh, group of a directory of um, you have small the, island you, countries. You have thirty seconds for this wish. UN. Yes. Yes. Okay. So for me, take the example of Sotome, and if you bring, if you make even a small project happen here, you could make a change yep. because you are really in need. You know. Any, any of, the, of those technology, you bring them to Sotome and make a pilot of it. And if it, if it comes to be viable and, and works, you're gonna, it's going to be impact. a very, very Excellent. important step. Matthew. Because, yeah, exactly, because, because we depend Thank on you. other technologies as well. Matthew, your wish, sir. Uh, I think in that conversion and getting to uh, to a place of financial viability, the biggest thing is funding for entrepreneurs and innovators. Uh, you know, Europe has got an incredibly well-developed stage gate or phase gate system of funding. You're rolling that out in other places of the world and, and, and connecting the, the innovation spaces geographically would be very helpful and helping people fail faster and figure out exactly what the right solution is for a certain energy mix or an energy solution and then getting that to convergence and scaling it. Excellent. Marius. I, I have to echo uh, Matthew's view as an entrepreneur. Um, I think I just also kind of go a little bit broader on a kind of economic, uh, almost on a government level for support for innovation, um, definitely. And then going back to um, Francisco's initial point on knowledge conversion. Uh, is sometimes, I must admit, I do feel a little bit lonely <laughs> down here at the tip of Africa. Uh, all, my, all my peers are uh, in Europe and all over the world. Um, so that type of knowledge conversion and collaboration um, at this stage of the wave energy game be super useful. Um, and then guys like uh, Arena, thank you. Without your reports and your standard uh, documentation helps us to sell our case, helps us to make our um, business cases strong, our uh, financial models uh, more believable. So I've just got to give a shout out to Irina for, for that. All right. Excellent. Gentlemen, this is really good. So I'm going to repeat these seven points very quickly for the audience. And this is what you, you heard it here first. So point number one, uh, pol political support. Point number two, innovation and business models. Um, point number three, don't reinvent the wheel, be innovative, but don't re recreate because you need scale. Point number four, build something and create precedence on the islands, have the impact, get it going. Link to point number five, which is funding and the ability to fail fast. Point number six is policy support and innovation, create an enabling environment that rewards and celebrates and enables innovation. And the final point with Demarius's point is the, the knowledge community and to avoid feeling lonely. Well, gentlemen, thank you very much for your participation this afternoon. I'm, I'm sure that the people who've taken time to check in have found this interesting. I certainly have. It's been varied. It's been great having the range of entrepreneurs, um, large, large, large European orientation, South, South Tome, a small island orientation. Thanks for your time. Good luck to all of you, especially the Matthew and, and Marius, keep on trucking, guys. We need, we need you. Um, in conclusion, um, the uh, Climate Investor 2, which is the business I run, we do fund a renewable energy, both um, land-based and marine. We have a fund called Climate Investor 2, which is focused on oceans specifically. we one of many. Um, so there are sources of capital out there to support these these interesting innovations and um, Karen doing what you're doing. Thank you, gentlemen. Enjoy the Thank rest of your afternoon. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Andrew. And all to sex for everybody. Yes. Cheers, guys. Thank you very much.